So today uh, the talk is divided into two basic parts. Uh, first, we will talk about uh, control and user plane separation, what we call as CUPS. And from there, we'll go to the second part, which is about the protocol. So the protocol is called the PFCP, Packet Forwarding Control Protocol. And these two are very, uh, you know, closely uh, linked uh, with each other. So the uh, talk requires you to be already familiar with the uh, telecom domain. If you are completely new to telecom domain, there are there will be many things in this talk that you may not understand. So uh, probably you can take a note of these things and uh, get in touch with me offline or check up the specs. So this is not meant for people who are completely new to 5G. So you need some background in 5G, some understanding of uh, the 5G architecture before you can uh, understand this talk. So let's start with uh, this basic understanding what is control and user plane separation, which is called uh, in short form CUPS. So if you look on the left side uh, of this figure, this is a traditional uh, 4G EPC. EPC stands for Evolved Packet Core where you have some control plane functions and uh, some nodes serving the user plane functions. So the MME is uh, primarily responsible for the control plane functions, meaning that signaling, setting up the call, you know, modifying the parameters of the call, looking at handover, those kind of things. Whereas the serving gateway and the PDN gateway, they are mostly concerned with the user plane functions, meaning that when someone when someone uh, sends actual user data, such as let's say a voice call or a video call or browsing the internet, those user data traffic goes through the serving gateway and the PDN gateway. So these two uh, entities in the network represent the user plane. But unfortunately, the way the spec is designed, at least in the earlier versions of the spec, these two entities, serving gateway and PDN gateway, also have some control plane functions, which is what you see here. Part of it is shaded in blue. Now, in the early parts of the standard, this was fine. But then when 5G came in and when LTE also started scaling up towards higher data rate, more stringent latency requirements, this presented a problem. Why? Because now, let's say you are in a busy period. Let's assume that uh, we are in New Year's Eve. So in a New Year's Eve kind of scenario, there will be a lot of traffic on the network. So what happens in such a scenario? You uh, you may be having, let's say, 10 serving gateways and maybe 50 uh, PDN gateways. That may not be enough. You may have to scale to 500. This you may have to scale to 50. So when, when you scale like that, it doesn't work, you know, because now uh, both of them have to be scaled in tandem. Because the uh, S gateway and the P gateway both have uh, user plane as well as control plane functions. You can't scale only the user plane functions and not scale the control plane functions because they are integrated into a single node. So then what the designers realize that we need to split the control and the user plane. So now looking back, it looks like such an obvious solution, but back then they never uh, thought that uh, such a requirement would arise in the future, that fi uh, 5G will become so popular or 4G will become so popular that we need to scale to tens and thousands of nodes uh, you know, we need to scale these units, uh, the control, the user plane and control plane independently. But the time came when they had, they decided that it was sensible to split the control plane and the user plane. And that is what CUPS is all about. So the evolved uh, network is what you see on the right side. MME stays the same. It is uh, serving only the control plane function, but the P gateway and the S gateway, now they are split into two parts. So the one in green is serving the user plane functions. The one in blue is serving the control plane functions. So now what advantage this uh, gives us? Uh, so what this gives us is now we can independently scale these two parts. I would request uh, participants to mute their mics. So when you have a question, you can uh, unmute yourself. 
So now what you have is that uh, these two parts can now independently scale. So for example, again, let's look, look back at the New Year Eve scenario. Suddenly you have more traffic, you need to scale this, but you don't need to scale the control plane so much. Maybe from five nodes, you want to scale to 50 nodes. That's fine. Even that is excessive. Maybe from five nodes, you want to scale to 20 nodes. You can scale it like that. But user plane, you know, you, you don't want to scale from five to 50. Maybe you want to scale from five to 500 because so much more traffic is going on on the user plane. Now, because of the separation, you can scale them independently. That is the first thing that uh, first benefit that you get by separating the control plane and the user plane. The second benefit we get is uh, now the network can choose the user plane location in a more flexible manner. So for example, to meet the stringent latency requirements, let's say which is common in many of the 5G use cases. So what we can do is, or what the control plane can do is that it can pick nodes which are closer to the RAM. For example, it can pick a serving gateway which is closer to the uh, RAM to which the UE is connected. So now packets on the user plane don't have to traverse too much in the network. And that reduces the latency. Similarly, it can choose a PDN gateway which is closer to the point uh, where the packets exit the mobile network and go into the data network. So that choice is there now with the with this new system where the control plane and the user plane are separated. So this uh, feature called CUPS was introduced in release uh, 14 uh, uh, of the LTE standard and subsequently in release 15 where the first standards for 5G came out, uh, uh, CUPS was already in place. That means the very first release of 5G, which is release 15, already had CUPS built into it. So now we have already seen in this diagram how CUPS works in the 4G uh, specific case. In 5G, it is very simple. In 5G, this is how CUPS works. So you know, we know from previous uh, knowledge that the 5G control plane is designed as a service-based architecture where all the functions are defined uh, in a very modular fashion and all these functions can communicate with one another using a service-based interface, which is typically just a HTTP call. So that is fine. All the control plane functions are over here. The user plane function in a 5G network is clearly separated from the control plane function, as you can see here. So UPF stands for user plane functions. Now you may be wondering, you know, why you have so many, you know, user uh, control plane functions in 5G when we had only MME in the 4G case. That's because here in this diagram, we have not shown the, all the other control plane functions which also exist on, in the 4G case. For that, let's look at a separate diagram, something like this. So you can see here, there are other functions, uh, you know, in 4G as well, which we have not shown in the other diagram but this diagram shows the equivalent functions. So in the 4G case, what we had as the P gateway control plane, S gateway control plane, and part of the MME, they are clubbed into one uh, entity in the 5G case, which is called session management function. That is what we see here. Likewise, if you look at the user plane, in the 4G case, we had P gateway user plane, S gateway user plane. That is after applying CUPS. That is now uh, represented in 5G as a single logical entity called the UPF, user plane function. So now this is the kind of separation we are looking at. So in the case of uh, 4G, we had uh, P gateway, S gateway separated into control and user plane functions. In the case of 5G, we have simply SMF and UPF. Each one, rep this one representing the control plane function and this one representing the user plane function. Now you may be wondering if 5G has integrated both these into a single entity, why can't we do that in 4G as well? Meaning that, okay, we have separated the control and user plane, but why not club the P gateway and the S gateway into a single entity the way it is done for in 5G, let's say SMF, for example, or UPF, for example. 
In fact, that option is also available in 4G. So in 4G, you have two ways of working with the cups. You can have cups in this manner where, for example, S gateway is separated from the P gateway like this. And of course, there is the control and user plane separation. Or you can have combined nodes. So take a look at this uh, node at the top of the picture. Here, what we are doing, we are combining the user plane functions of S gateway and the P gateway. Similarly, we are combining the control plane functions of S gateway and the P gateway. Now it's a lot easier to compare this against what we have in 5G. This basically represents the kind of SMF in 5G. Sorry, this is the user plane function. This represents the UPF in 5G. This is the control plane functions, which is representing the SMF in 5G. So this is what uh, you know, CUPS is all about, both, both in the 5G case and in the 4G case. So CUPS is applicable both uh, for 4G and 5G, but in 4G it got introduced in release uh, 14. So if you look at the evolution of CUPS within the standards, the work for CUPS started way back in July 2015, where the initial proposal or the feasibility study was uh, launched uh, to understand what CUPS is and how to implement CUPS within the standard. And then the first technical report on CUPS was published in 2016. Subsequently, you know, the first one of the first standards which was published about CUPS is the 23.214 which specifies the architectural changes which were needed to support CUPS in uh, LTE EPC. So as I mentioned earlier, this was leading towards release 14. And then subsequently, this standard was uh, updated for release 15, 16, and 17. But most of it is uh, minor updates. Of course, all these updates are kind of backward compatible. So this is when you know CUPS kind of got introduced into 4G. Formally, release 14 actually came out in 2017. At the same time, towards the end of 2017, that is December 2017, we had the early drop of release 15, which is the first uh, release of 5G. And even in the first release of 5G, we had cups in place, which is what I explained earlier. And the main standard for uh, cups, of course, there are many. Uh, two of the main standards is 29.244 and uh, 38.401. There are others which I have not mentioned here. OK, so this is the broad introduction of CUPS. Now we have been talking about CUPS from the perspective of the core network. So far we have been talking about the core network, but the 5G uh, system is not just the core network or for that matter, the 4G system. It's not just the core network. We also have the radio access network. So now the interesting question is, does CUPS apply on the radio access network? So the answer, of course, is yes. So here is a diagram or image that represents uh, the radio access network. Uh, you can say G node B is represented here. Now in the radio access network, uh, you might have heard of something called uh, disaggregation. So previously we had, let's say, baseband unit and uh, a remote unit or a radio unit. But in the uh, in the kind of disaggregation that is going on in the RAN, this is further disaggregated into three parts. You have the radio unit, you have the distributed unit, and you have the centralized unit. CU stands for centralized unit, TU is distributed unit, RU is radio unit. This is how you know, people uh, designed uh, the disaggregation of the RAN. But from this, they disaggregated further. As you can see here, the centralized unit is disaggregated further into control plane and user plane. So now this becomes interesting. CUPS is not just for uh, the core network. It is also applicable for the radio access network, where you can disaggregate the centralized unit into control plane and the user plane. And then because of this, new interfaces are created. So for example, control plane and user plane are interfaced using the E1 interface. 
Likewise, CU and DU are interfaced using the F1C and the F1U interface. So because of this disaggregation, new interfaces come into play. Same thing happens uh, in the core network. Now you may be wondering what actually goes into this particular thing, control, uh, centralized unit control plane, centralized unit user plane, what goes into DU, what goes into RU. So we'll not get into the details, but briefly, if we recall the stack of the RAM, what are the layers that we have? We have the physical layer, we have Mac, we have RLC. Then above RLC, uh, on the control plane, we have, uh, I think, PDCP or RRC. Then on the user plane, again, we have PDCP and SDAP. So those are the layers we have on the user plane. Those are the layers we have on the control plane. So now we can imagine RRC will be in the control plane, in the CUCP. PDCP, part of the PDCP will also be in CUCP. SDAP will be on the user plane. Part of PD, uh, PDCP will also be in the user plane. RLC and MAC, typically they are in the distributed unit. And then part of the physical layer is in the distributed unit. Part of the physical layer is in the radio unit. So there are different ways in which these kind of splits can happen, but I'm just uh, talking about one particular split, which is typically referred to in the standard as 7.2 split. So we'll not get into the details, but there is cups. So the purpose of this slide is simply to drive home the point that cups is also applicable on the RAM. And uh, typically it is done in the centralized unit where some functionality like RRC and the PDCP is here. And the user plane has other things like uh, SDAP and PDCP. OK, so this is the broad introduction of CUPS. Now I last point I want to cover is that uh, we saw that. In the case of, uh, for example, in the case of. Uh, in the case of 4G, when we do, uh, when we split the control plane and the user plane, we introduce new interfaces. For example, in the S gateway side, we introduce an interface called SXA. I'll enlarge this diagram. In the S gateway side, we introduce a new interface called SXA. In the P gateway side, we introduce a new interface called SXB. And where we have combined functionality, these two interfaces basically get combined. The reason for these interfaces is that because earlier these two were co-located, they were integrated into a single box. So we didn't need this interface and uh, the control plane and the user plane could freely exchange information. That is no longer the case. We have deliberately split the functions. So now there is a need to define a new interface between these two. The same thing applies for. For what for 5G? Same thing applies. Now we have a new interface between SMF and UPF. Because the control plane and user plane functions are clearly split. And this interface between SMF and UPF that is called the N4 interface. So now with the introduction of new uh, interfaces between control plane and user plane. There was a question mark. How will these? two entities now communicate. What will be the protocol that they can use to communicate? So now the 3GPP deliberated on this. They looked at already existing protocols uh, in the industry. And they kind of adopted the best practices from different protocols and they came up with a new protocol called PFCP, Packet for Forwarding Control Protocol. And that is what we will be talking about next. So before we go into PFCP, any questions or comments at this point? Anyone can uh, chip in. Any questions or comments at this point? OK, no questions. That's fine, we can ask later. So now let's talk about PFCP, which is the packet forwarding 
control protocol. So for that, I have a separate. Uh, article here. So like I said earlier. With the introduction of cups, now we have opened up new interfaces. So in the case of uh, 4G, we have SXA, SXB. There is also something called SXC, which I did not discuss in the earlier uh, slide. But there is an optional entity in 4G called traffic detection function. So that also is split into control plane and user plane. So that interface is called SXC. And in the case of 5G, as I described earlier, we have the UPF, uh, we have the N4 interface, which is uh, between uh, SMF and UPF. So now on all these interfaces, the way the control and user plane entities communicate is using the PFCP protocol. So this is how the stack looks like for PFCP. So as you can imagine, there is the L1 and L2, and on top of that, you have IP and UDP. So PFCP sits on top of uh, UDP IP. Okay, I hope this is this is simple to understand, very clear. Now the only traffic that this PFCP protocol carries is the control packets. It does not carry any user packets uh, between the two functions. That is between the control plane and user plane functions. Now what can you say about this stack? By looking at this, what can you say? Some of you can probably take a guess. What does UDP imply for you? We, we, we know that in networking, very commonly used protocols are UDP and TCP at the transport layer. So what are we achieving by selecting UDP? What is the limitation of selecting UDP? Anybody? Uh, sorry, uh, you are talking about this is Hassan. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. What is your response? My yeah, question yeah. is, uh, yeah. what do you uh, make out by the fact that we are using UDP? Yeah, it's be, it's you know in TCP it is uh, be, before uh, transmitting data you have to have uh, negotiation. It means that TCP is uh, connection oriented, and uh, it may uh, have some delays and. Uh, even if uh, there is something uh, wrong in negotiation, the decision is going to be dropped. But in the UDP, it is the it is not connection oriented and it is uh, connection less means that it's gonna faster than TCP. This is uh, at a, uh, in at first look. Okay, okay, uh, thank you. Your answer is in fact uh, spot on. Correct. So uh, I will continue from here. So as he mentioned, yes, he is uh, absolutely right. So the thing about UDP is that it doesn't guarantee delivery of packets. So that is the first thing. So TCP does retransmission of packets, guarantees delivery. Even if there are uh, packets get lost or acknowledgements get lost, the sender will retransmit the packet. But in UDP, that is not there. Then the second important point he mentioned is TCP is kind of a heavy protocol, connection oriented. So you have to set up the connection, maintain the connection. Uh, so that maintenance is involved. So, uh, so to solve those problems, they have adopted UDP and some of the functions which are typically performed by TCP are performed by PFCP. So let's come to the procedures that are expected from PFCP. So PFCP, PFCP is the one that does the retransmission because it is sit sitting on top of UDP but we still need some sort of guarantee that the packets that are exchanged or messages that are exchanged between sender and receiver, that is, let's say between SMF and UPF, they are received correctly. So what happens in a PFCP protocol, you have messages which are typically requests. And for every request, there's a response. Now the request can go from the user plane function or it can go from the control plane function, doesn't matter but the response has to come back from the peer entity. So if the UP is sending a request, the CP which is receiving that request should send back the response. So if the response is not received within a certain timeout, the PFCP protocol says that the sender has to retransmit that message. So that is the first point because we don't have TCP. 
PFCP is now in charge of re retransmission. Second point, uh, second procedure which is part of PFCP is that there are many messages which are exchanged between uh, control plane and user plane functions. But there could be a lot of messages which uh, actually increases the signaling load on the network. So for efficiency, uh, what PFCP defines is that many messages can be bundled together. So there are two types of messages in PFCP, uh, which I will cover shortly. One type of message is session related messages. The other type is node related messages. So this concept of bundling messages together applies only for session related messages. So multiple session session related messages which are exchanged between the same uh, UP and CP, they can be bundled together in the same transaction. Kind of the uh, transaction you can call it. So that is purely done for efficiency sake. But what happens? Suppose this bundled message gets lost or there is an error. Then PFCP has to retransmit. So now there is no requirement that the retransmission also has to be bundled. Because probably the network is bad. There is some congestion in the network. The PFCP node can unbundle the message and transmit the messages individually separately. So bundling doesn't mean that retransmissions also have to be bundled. So that flexibility is there in the PFCP protocol. Now, what are the messages that uh, PFCP supports? So this is closely related to the kind of procedures that PFCP uh, is supposed to perform. So as I mentioned uh, just now, there are two types of uh, procedures and equivalently two types of messages. One set is called node related messages and the other set is called session related messages. Without going into too much detail, briefly node related messages are heartbeat messages. So just to know if the peer node is alike. What do I mean by peer node? So I already mentioned, you know, PSCP is basically connecting control plane node with the user plane node. So a control plane node will be associated with a user plane node. Once they are associated, this becomes the peer of this and vice versa. So these two now are now kind of paired up, you can say. So one is the peer of the other. So when we say heartbeat messages, this is simply for one node to know that the peer node is alive. Okay. The other kind of node related messages is load control. So here an example is the user plane function sends to the control plane. What is his current load? So a user plane functions can be handling you know dozens of sessions probably hundreds of sessions so the control plane needs to know how many sessions is this guy handling can i also give him more sessions so that is enabled using control plane procedure uh, this sorry this load control procedure but what happens if the user plane is overloaded then there is another procedure which kicks in called the overload control so in this, the user plane informs the control plane that it is already overloaded. Now, if new sessions come into the network, this control plane will be very careful. It will not select this user plane for more sessions because this guy is already overloaded. Then we have the important procedure called association setup update release. Just now the uh, gentleman who was uh, speaking, he talked about how TCP is a connection oriented protocol. So before a TCP uh, entity can send any package to the other entity, a connection has to be set up and only after that they can start sending packets or exchanging packets. But because we are using UDP, which is not a connection oriented protocol, how do we have uh, some sort of a connection oriented behavior uh, between the control plane and the user plane? So that kind of equivalent behavior is achieved using the association procedures. So association is nothing but uh, a user, a control plane selecting a user plane for future uh, use of the user plane resources. So it is kind of like uh, there are like dozens of user plane functions out there or hundreds of user plane functions. So the control plane has to know what are the user plane functions out there and uh, uh, associate with them in advance so that when a session has to be established, 
the uh, session establishment becomes quicker because you are already established with one or more of user plane functions. The other important, uh, yeah, I mean, it also makes sense when we look at association in relation to the other functions which are out here. So let's say I need to set up a session because let's say incoming call is happening or you know the user is making a call or launching a new session, let's say browsing the internet. So in those cases, a new PDO session has to be established to carry the user plane packets. So to establish the PDO session, the control plane has to establish a session with the user plane. But now the question for the control plane is which session, which user plane function should it use? How will it know? So it has no idea unless it has already associated with one or more user plane functions. And from these associated user plane functions, the control plane function will have this load control function which is going on or heartbeat function which is going on. So using these function, uh, these procedures, the control plane will know what are the what is the current status of the user plane function. First of all, is the user plane function alive? Secondly, how loaded is the user plane function or is it already overloaded? So suppose the user plane function is not overloaded and the load is very reasonable, then this will get selected for the new uh, PDU session. That is how that is one of the ways in which control plane function takes decisions, which you know user plane function should handle the incoming session, the new session. And the, how exactly a user plane function, uh, how exactly a user plane function is selected by a control plane function, this is not fully specified in the standard because this is very much implementation specific, and uh, every vendor can do implement this differently. But we know uh, these are the things that will be used uh, in selecting a particular user plane function. And as I mentioned in the earlier part of the talk. Another parameter for selecting the user plane function is how close is the user plane function to the RAN or to the DNN, that is the external network, data network, how close it is, it is to these entities, because that also determines the latency of the overall user plane path. So this is about node related procedures. Then we come to the session related procedures, which is very simple to understand. This involves establishing modification or releasing a session. So uh, obviously before a session can be established with a UPF, this uh, there should be a association done between uh, control plane function and the user plane function. Only when it is associated, you can have session related sessions established on that particular UPF. Otherwise you can't do it. So this is uh, like a broad understanding of the different functions which are or procedures which are applicable in the PFCP protocol. And uh, these can also be related to the messages that are supported by PFCP. As you can see, heartbeat message, association messages. Uh, then you have session related messages. Yeah, session related messages. Uh, then uh, where are the others? Yeah, these are the broadly the ones. Now uh, applicability. So some are not applicable on some interfaces. So for example, PFCP session set deletion. So these set methods are not applicable in 5G on the, uh, sorry, in a particular variant of uh, uh, 5G. But uh, yeah, on, on the SXC, these messages are not applicable. So I don't, I will not go into the details of these things. Uh, I have not explored this in detail, but you can study this table to understand, uh, you know, the applicability of each of these messages to the different interfaces. Okay. So we have already covered about association. Uh, one of the things about association is a control plane function can be associated at the same time with multiple user plane functions and vice versa. That is. A single user plane function can be associated with multiple user plane uh, control plane functions. So the association between uh, CP and UP, it's many to many. 
So what is the logic here? The logic is that uh, a UPF, for example, user plane function can be serving hundreds of sessions and these sessions can belong uh, to different, uh, I mean, belong, belong in the sense can, could have been launched by different UPF functions, uh, user, uh, sorry, control plane functions. So that is uh, the reason why the association is many to many. OK, any questions at this point? Uh, oh, one question. Uh, this is Miftah okay. on this side. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, like uh, uh, the, the PFCP protocol, OK, so one thing that uh, uh, that comes to my mind is there is already the SCTP protocol for uh, for this control plane. W what was the uh, trigger for uh, going for another protocol uh, and uh, uh, getting this uh, done? Because uh, even now we use, in, even in 5G, we use SCTP protocol on uh, on top of UDP and then the NGAP runs on top of that. Right, so, yeah. So good question. So SCTP has different uh, protocol semantics. The purpose of SCTP is different. So it is to connect uh, G node B with uh, AMF. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah. So the kind of messages that are exchanged between these two entities are very different from what is exchanged between uh, uh, SMF and UPF. So that is why they could not reuse the SCTP protocol. OK, OK, OK. So that's that's the reason we have another protocol. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. because yeah. the semantics are different. The kind of uh, information that is carried is different. So they had to come up with a different protocol. OK, 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 thank you. Any other questions? Hey, Arvind, uh, Sanjay, this side. I just have yeah. a question. This interface, what we were mentioning, SXA and SXB. Yeah. Uh, are these interfaces only for the control plane or the user plane? Oh, it's an interesting question. Actually, these interfaces are connecting the control and user plane, so we no. can't say they are. Uh, uh, no, I understand that point. So my yeah. question is slightly different, and I, I, I am taking a reference from uh, the N4 interface, right? Uh, yeah. so let me, uh, you know, just uh, change my question, and instead of talking about SXA and SXB, uh, N4 interface. Also, I'm not talking about uh, connecting the control plane and the user plane part of it. I'm talking about the N4 interface. Is this N4 interface is only the control plane or also the user plane? Uh, yeah, now I think I understand your question. So my answer is somewhat similar, but I'll change it a little bit. Mm -hmm. See, still I will say that it's really connecting the control plane and user plane because the control plane function is uh, uh, concentrated in the SMF for the N4 mm -hmm. interface. Mm -hmm. User plane functionality is concentrated in the UPF. Mm -hmm. Right. So now N4 is connecting these two. Uh, one is the control plane and the user plane. But having said that, now let's look at what kind of packets go on the N4 interface. Probably mm -hmm. that is where you are, uh, yep. your question is targeting. Right. Yeah. So now the question is, does only control plane packets go on the N4 interface? Because that is the purpose of N4. The purpose of N4 is for control plane to select or associate with the user plane function mm -hmm. and then configure the user plane function for subsequent sessions. Mm -hmm. Let's say PDU sessions when packets are flowing, UPF mm -hmm. has to do certain things with the uh, incoming data packets. Mm -hmm. So to configure the UPF, the uh, control plane function will use the N4 interface to first mm -hmm. associate with the user plane function and then configure the user plane function mm -hmm. for the sessions. Mm -hmm. But all these packets flowing between control plane and user plane function, they are all control packets. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Arvind. Right. So if you see, uh, uh, so before yeah, I, uh, I have not completed before my I... answer, so all yeah. these are control yeah. plane functions. But okay. there is one exception. Mm -hmm. In some special scenarios, mm -hmm. right, which I have mentioned here, in some scenarios, user plane data packets may also be sent on these interfaces between CP and UP. Mm -hmm. But these user plane packets, because they are not control packets, they don't use PFCP. They are, in fact, using GTPU. Yeah, perfect. So I, I think I was actually referring exactly to the same thing, right? I, I, what are those scenarios, right? I know a couple of them, so just wanted to hear anything uh, from your side, right? So what are the typical scenarios where we need to send the user plane data in the N4 interface? Yeah, so uh, one particular scenario is let's say the user plane function is going to be teared down or relocated. 
mm-hmm. then the packets have to be buffered somewhere. Mm-hmm. So now you can send those packets to the control plane function, which will buffer the packets until the new a new UPF is selected. Mm-hmm. So to send the so uh, because the packets have to be buffered in the uh, control plane function, mm-hmm. they have to be sent on the N4 interface to buffer it in the C- mm-hmm. SMF. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that is one scenario. There are like that few other scenarios. I have not gone into the details, but this yep. is one of those scenarios yep. where okay. some buffering so, has to be done on yeah, the think, SMF. Yeah, I think that answers my questions. Now I'll just uh, uh, I was like the other, another scenario is where uh, we we need to actually authenticate the user uh, from the external PDNs, especially in the corporate network environments. Right, that is another scenario when we use SMF as a uh, you know some having some kind of user pen data. Now I'm taking going back to the previous question. So does that apply to SXA, SXB interface as well, or it only applies to N4 interface? Uh, I'm not sure, but okay. uh, I don't see why it should not apply for uh, the N4. I was sure yeah. N4. I was aware that it happens and yeah. there are two scenarios which I already know. I thought that there can be some more uh, procedures because of that. Right, but I wanted to understand same uh, for SXA and SXB if that is true. Yeah, it might be applicable because uh, we can quickly. Another, another thing which is mentioned here, N4 MB, what is that? N4 I understand, N4 MB is what? No, I have not explored that. There is a particular feature of uh, 5G which is mm-hmm. referred as N4 MB. Okay. I have not explored what it is, so we have to right. read okay. the standard. No problem. I, I have come across this, uh, uh, you know, term for the very first time, so just thought of asking. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, uh, Arvind. Thanks for answering this. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, now, what? Uh, so we looked at all the different messages which flow between the user plane and control plane functions. Now, if we are a developer. One of the first questions that we will ask is what is the encoding of these messages? And these messages in turn contain many IEs, IEs in the sense uh, information elements. So now we know other protocols in the 5G system, for example, RRC or uh, NGAP. So each of these protocols have a way of encoding their messages. So uh, sometimes the uh, encoding is TLV format. In other cases, the encoding is uh, ASN.1 with PER encoding and so on or other types of encoding with the ASN.1. So in the case of PFC, uh, PFCP, the encoding is following a TLV format, simple TLV format. So this is an example, a packet uh, blow up. So we have a ex- sample packet, uh, and in this particular case, we are showing an example of uh, PFCP session establishment request. And in this particular example, you can see that this uh, message is identified by a type. Then there is a length which shows, you know, how many bytes are going to follow. And then finally, uh, the content of the message, which we call the value. So this is what we typically refer to as TLV format, type, length, and value. So the rest of the packet is the value part. And in some uh, acronyms, TLV stands for tag, length, and value, but they are equivalent. Uh, the meaning is the same. So in this example, this is the packet. This is the length in bytes, and uh, then the content of the packet follows. And within the packet, uh, every packet has a sequence number. And then uh, you have the session uh, ID. Then we have other parameters, which are what we call the information elements. Now, if you look into one of these information elements, if you blow it up, for example, create QER, you will find that in turn it has its own type, length, and value, and so forth. So take another example, PDN type, which is here it's set to IPv4. It has its own type, length, and value. In this case, the value is IPv4, type is 113, defined by 113. That is the, the type, the number indicating this particular IE type. Then the length is just one byte because here we are signaling nothing more than the PDN type, whether it's an IPv4 packet or a different type of uh, packet. So in in brief, the kind of encoding that we follow in PFCP is a TLV format. 
OK. Now, as a developer, another question you may ask is OK. I, I am now asked to implement the PF, PF, PFCP protocol. Now, if you had asked me this question, let's say 20 years ago, I would have told you some tips and tricks to implement a P or best practices, let us say, to implement a protocol like this or to implement uh, the encoding and decoding of TLV. But today we are in the world of open source, so the answer is much simpler. There are already lots of open source implementations of PFCP. So as a developer, our first point of call is to see what are the open source implementations out there, what is the kind of licensing that these implementations use, and whether we can use these implementations in a commercial product. So I will not go into the details, but these are some of the implementations out there, right? This is an implementation of PFCP in Go language. So from, for some reason, Go language is very popular in the telecom world for implementing many of the 5G, uh, 5G uh, protocols in the infrastructure in the core. So this is one example uh, of uh, PFCP implementation. What is the licensing? It is a MIT license. Another implementation uh, here, this is, uh, yeah, it's got some UML definition. It's, so here you will get some ideas how to implement PFCP if you are asked to implement the same. So you get some idea here. Next, we come to another project. Again, here you have an implementation of uh, a PFCP agent. And then finally, uh, again, a proof of concept uh, POC for implementing PFCP. So again, what is the language here? So you can see here. Mostly it is Go. And they use something called P4. Yeah. So this is some basic. Uh, like pointers to you on implementing PFCP if you are required or you are keen to do this uh, in your job. So currently where I am working, I am leading a team where we are implementing PFCP in uh, C Sharp and .NET. So uh, of course our code is very different from this, but yeah, if you are required to implement in some other language, you need not start from scratch. You can get an idea how they are doing it here. Maybe you will get some interesting pointers. The other thing I want to point out for uh, developers is that patents. Right. You can also search for patents. Uh, which uh, are dealing with PFCP. So for example, here there is a patent, uh, you know, which is talking about PFCP association procedure for session re restoration, which is a specific procedure which, in, uh, which is defined in the standard. It is applicable both for 4G as well as uh, 5G. But many of these procedures, uh, it is it will not be specified in the specs, okay? Because it is purely uh, up to the implementation. It will still be conforming to the 3GPP specs, but it need not be standardized. Standardized. So this is where people can patent a completely different type of implementation where they try to do something unique. So earlier we spoke about, uh, for example, one of the important things in this whole procedure is how does a C, uh, control plane function select a user plane function? How, how does it select? Obviously, I mentioned a few things like it will look at the current load whether it's already overloaded, it will look at the current loca location of the uh, user plane function, and then it will consider what is the incoming uh, session which needs to be set up. So it will, and many more things like that. What are the QoS requirements of this particular session? And whether the particular U UPF, which is whether the available UPF, which of these can meet the QoS? So there are so many things which need to be considered for a, for the selection of a UPF. So that selection process is not standardized. And again, I believe there are some patents which may be talking about how to select a UPF function. 
but then there could be uh, many approaches which are not patented which are like uh, industry secrets so people like nokia and cisco they may be doing the selection processes in their uh, equipment but they will not be disclosing it uh, exactly how they are selecting a particular uh, upf given the current you know state of the network so the reason i mentioned this about patents is that as a developer it is good always to study what are the patents associated with in this particular example pfcp because it can give you ideas where we can innovate and possibly if you can get some ideas you can create your own patent regarding certain aspects of uh, pfcp implementation or for that matter in general you know management of a pdu session so now having covered those aspects now we come to the last part of the talk we'll go into a little bit more detail about uh, pfcp but i have kept this to the last because this uh, not something i understand fully because there are many details here so one of the important things is that what is the packet processing model so this so this can be explained using this uh, image so we are looking at a user plane uh, function in the case of uh, 5g it is upf in the case of 4g this is what is called as a combined node we talked about the combined node where the user plane function of both the s gateway and the p gateway are combined into one node so in this figure they are representing that as sp gateway u so what happens here basically uh, the user plane function is already configured by the control plane function for a particular session and everything is ready then a packet starts coming into the user plane function so the first thing the user plane function has to do is to identify which is the pfcp session because remember that our user plane function is handling hundreds of sessions because yeah we don't know how many hundreds but potentially it is handling hundreds of session first thing it has to do is to identify which is the session uh, to which this packet should be associated so for that it applies a certain rule called pdr packet detection rule so it has a bunch of rules which are configured by the control plane function and it will go through all those uh, rules and it will find a match once it finds a match it's a one to one mapping it, now there is no confusion one once a match to a pdr is found pdr stands for packet detection rule once a match is found the upf immediately understands this packet belongs to this particular pfcp session okay once the session is found now for this particular session that is not the only pdr actually there are multiple pdrs which are configured for that session right so now what the upf will do it will now look up all these pdrs for that particular session and it will select the highest pdr with the highest precedence so there are multiple pdrs which are configured for every session and they have a precedence so the one with the highest precedent will be selected so that is the second step of processing for the incoming packet once the pdr is selected then the third step comes in where for every pdr there are multiple other rules which are configured one of the rule is called forwarding uh, forward far so what is the full form of far forwarding something let me open that file forwarding action rules forwarding yeah, action so rule far stands for forwarding action rules uh, so uh once i mean just sorry i mean can i ask a pdr so the pdr has associated rules and one of the rules is far which is kind of mandatory so use it will select the particular far on which uh, which will be applied before the packet is sent out to the uh, whichever side it may be sent out towards the core network or uh, sorry towards the ue or towards the data external data network so either way the far will be applied on when just before the packet is sent out but there are other rules which are optional for example the other rules are qer qs enforcement rule urr usage report rules 
buffer actions rules, PAR, multi access rules, MAR. So I have just described them briefly. I myself don't understand this fully. I have not uh, come to the implementation of these things. So far in our work, we have implemented this and implemented this. We have not yet looked into these things. But uh, yeah, that is something we are going to be doing in the next few weeks. So broadly, this is how it works. So just to summarize uh, three parts. First, identify the session using the PDR, then select the PDR with the highest precedence. And for that PDR, pick out all the configured uh, rules, other rules such as FAR, QER, and so on. And then apply FAR on the outgoing packet. And other rules which are applicable, they will also be applied. Now all these rules are configured in advance, but configuring all these uh, rules every time for every session can be heavy on the signaling uh, on the network. The signaling load can go up. So what the PFCP standard allows, it also allows you to uh, have predefined PDRs along with the predefined uh, FARs and QERs and so on. So with predefined uh, rules, uh, you don't need to configure them every time. You just point the name and uh, the UPF will know, OK, this is the rule which I need to apply. So that uh, functionality is also there. So any questions? Uh, so that is all I have to share with you. So any questions, I can try to answer them yeah. or any comments. Of course, some of you may be working on PFCP or UPF or SMF. You may be knowing more. So anything you want to share at this point, go ahead. Anyone? Anybody is working on PFCP at the moment? Or SMF or UPF? OK, nobody. Yeah, so probably it is just actually. Uh, sorry, sorry. Thank you for everything. It was great. Actually, I have studied about that and even I worked with Python, actually not Golang. Uh, okay. regarding yeah. PFCP, uh, okay. you know better than me. This is the magic of SDN actually. And in COPS, we divided it in parts, OK? But in uh, SDN, uh, th th there is one southbound interface which is using OpenFlow and the PFCP is exactly based on OpenFlow, which yeah. most of the operate, I mean, providers supporting that. Yeah. And it is good. It is great. It is starting actually. Uh, hopefully, it's going to cover all interfaces. I mean, in near future, because you know we need to have harmonized interfaces. You know, at the moment, even in 5G uh, core, we have three different uh, interfaces between two different, uh, no, three different uh, signaling interfaces or control plane interfaces between the uh, underlay uh, network and even control plane, which it is the SDN uh, actually uh, orchestrator. Uh, for example, uh, NGAP interface and N1 interface between the UE to the AMF and the G node B2 AMF, and another one is between the UPF and the SMF, okay? And even we have divided the uh, orchestrator in two functions, AMF and uh, SMF, which they are going to be combined actually together. And uh, I hope actually, but, but, but this is a very uh, clever. I mean, STM magic is clever and it's going to hopefully in near future uh, take over all interfaces, but this is good. And I, I've told you just, I've, uh, uh, I just uh, started it early, but uh, I'm working with Python actually, not, okay, not Go. Okay. But I'm going to uh, even use the, the, this. We, we can have uh, offline uh, via email, we can have connection together gotcha. to yeah. share the information with each other. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you, Hassan, for sharing that. And uh, as Hassan mentioned, you know, when uh, 3GPP was designing uh, PFCP, they were inspired by many other protocols, open flow, forces, diameter, and uh, IETF uh, 
specific protocol. So they looked at all these protocols, they adopted bits and pieces, and they had a set of requirements to fulfill. And based on this uh, study, they came up with the PFCP protocol. So yeah, so as he mentioned, probably heavily influenced by OpenFlow as well. Okay, any other questions or uh, observations, comments? Okay, if no other questions, I think we'll conclude here. A uh, couple of things to mention. Uh, uh, firstly, these two articles uh, which I was using for today's session, they are already published on devopedia.org. So those of you who are interested, you can go and read them. I have not completed them, uh, but I'll be completing them in a couple of days. So there is one article, Control and User Plane Separation. So you can read about it. Uh, you know, the explanation is enhanced by using images and uh, for those who want to understand the context better, uh, you can also look at how it has evolved, when it started, and uh, what is the current state of adoption. So it's likewise, the other article is the PFCP article itself, and similarly here, the relevant details are captured. So I believe that uh, reading these two articles will give you a faster path towards understanding uh, PFCP rather than reading them directly from the standards. Right? So we have tried to assimilate or bring together the most important, important uh, parts and uh, putting them in a single article with the relevant images. So this will make it easier for you to you know, understand uh, both uh, CUPS as well as PFCP. Finally, a recording of this video will also become available uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so that will be available uh, in an hour from now.